What's up guys, Brian here. I wanted to give a little update on Ethereum just like I did for Bitcoin a couple days ago. You can check out that video in our videos section. It was the last one we posted. Um, this one's gonna take a look more so at, uh, or I should say exclusively at our number two uh, crypto market cap asset in cryptocurrency right now. Um, Ethereum's been doing some interesting stuff, more not so fun than fun as of late. We're back down around 1950 at the time of this video. Um, plenty of reasons why that's happened, and I'll try to jump into just a few examples uh, to give you guys an idea of how we use our metrics to really understand the markets, um, figure out whether a price move is justified or whether you know FUD or FOMO uh, contributed to something going way too high or way too low that you can take advantage of. Right now, uh, by my judgment, the pullback looks justified. It doesn't mean that it's going to continue, but it means where we've fallen right now at around 1950 looks about right based on what our metrics indicate. There's not a huge bullish divergence, not a huge bearish divergence, but each metric that we'll look at right now will give you a little bit of a, a glimpse as to what might be slightly favoring the bulls and what might be slightly favoring the bears. There's nothing that's ever going to perfectly say this is exactly where the price should be. Um, but, the, you know, the way we try to conclude where prices are going to go is by kind of aggregating as many of our key metrics as possible and measuring, you know, are four or five of them looking bullish, then that's probably a good sign. If four or five, four or five or all five of them are, are looking bearish, probably a good idea to be a little bit safe and conservative right, conservative right now with your portfolio. But um, we'll jump into it really quick, and I'll just go over about five metrics here. Um, I'm going to aim for a quick, you know, 10 to 15 minute video at most. So uh, first off, we're looking at daily active addresses over the last year and comparing that to daily active deposits. And active deposits are just known deposit addresses, um, while active addresses are all known active addresses that we have in our database. Um, whether they're deposits, withdrawals, et cetera. Um, so daily active addresses is essentially like the total amount where deposits are kind of like the, the warning sign addresses exclusively because when there are deposits that are rising up really high, like we saw back here in late April, that's a really scary sign that we're starting to approach a top. And sure enough, about a week later, nah, two weeks later, that's when the all-time high happened. So this was kind of the forewarning that you should probably start to be a little weary. And of course, it still ran from 2,700 all the way up to, uh, I think, 42 or so uh, was that new all-time high, give or take, depending on the exchange. Um, and that's generally how this metric works. When you have huge spikes in active deposits while the active addresses are staying low, that is a sign of a correction. And of course, this doesn't look that big because this one kind of just dwarfs it up here. But if I were to zoom in, you can do that simply by highlighting any part of the graph. You can see very, see very clearly that this was still a relatively massive pullback back here on September 1st or so. And I remember clearly because Santiment was posting a lot about, you know, how many altcoins were collapsing right around this time. Uh, altcoins were really booming around here and people really got sort of duped and faked out and we're FOMOing in around here. And that's when Ethereum and a lot of alts dropped off of a cliff. And of course, Bitcoin did too, but Bitcoin drops off a lot less uh, than the rest of the markets. And that's why Bitcoin is um, kind of considered the relative safe haven compared to altcoins. But in this case, you can see clearly here, you know, August 30th, big drop in address activity, but notice that deposits rose. And then address activity kind of got a little bit back to normal, still a little lower than it was. But look at active deposits just take off. That's, that's the sign that you're about to see some sort of correction in most cases. Never guaranteed, but in this case, it fit perfectly. And down went Ethereum from about 483 all the way down to 322 in the span of four days. Um, let's go back to more recent times, last three months here we can see really clearly that around the all-time high, I'm gonna try not to hover so you guys can actually see it. This part right here, uh, active deposits took a big leap. Um, keep in mind these axes are on their own. 
So these aren't the same numbers. If you see where I'm dragging, daily active addresses is, is way more. It's about 10 times more than active deposits, but they're being graphed on their own axis, which is why you see um, you know, active addresses looking like it's higher than, at, at, or at deposits looking like it's bigger than addresses here. Um, but yeah, long story short, active deposits took off right around the all-time high, price dropped off a cliff. We saw again right here, you would have had kind of a, a two-day warning signal here that active deposits had just hit its biggest spike since really that big, you know, a, a few, maybe a week or so after the all-time high. And that was a big sign that this probably wasn't going to last for too much longer, this rise here. Um, where we're at now, active, active deposits are relatively low. They're actually back, you know, to levels that really weren't seen since April. The problem is address activity isn't much better. It's, it's at least a little more flat over the past couple months than active deposits is. So, you know, very mild bullish signal here, but not much to, you know, really celebrate. We'll move right on down to average fees, which is a great metric that's exclusive to Ethereum on our platform. I'll just maximize the screen here really quick. Uh, we hit just crazy, crazy high fees right before the all-time high and actually on the day of the all-time high when we nearly hit $70 per transaction. Um, that, of course, was an all-time high. We had one more big fee spike here uh, that kind of acted right before a small, small bounce. Um, but generally speaking, average fees, as you would expect, is good because it allows traders and investors to feel more free and less hesitant to uh, make transactions and circulate tokens. And ultimately, circulating tokens is what allows prices to rise on a, you know, a healthy basis. And right now, we're pretty much right back to cheap fees, uh, which is very, very good to see. Uh, the latest date here showed that average fees were just $5. So that's a far cry from where we were at almost 70 on all-time high day back on May 12th. So good, good sign here. This is definitely bullish. You know, we want to see uh, average fees staying low. Um, otherwise, it becomes more challenging to keep up at the pace, you know, that Ethereum is climbing when you start to see these just gaudy, uh, ridiculous numbers that people don't really want to deal with when making transactions. Moving on down, supply and exchanges. Um, as many point out in our community, this does need to be taken with a grain of salt because DeFi is still a relatively new thing in crypto. And what this is measuring is the actual percentage of Ethereum supply that's on exchanges. So when it's high, that's generally a bit scary uh, because it means there's a higher risk of sell-offs that can happen with more Ethereum actually capable of being sold off in big chunks by a big whale who decides that that's where they want the top to be. And then they send the price plummeting down. Um, you know, we kind of saw it stay high here despite the big price plummet. And then finally, after it's ranged here for about, you know, up until last week or so, it was still still high until it just dropped down here to, um, you know, back to about 17%, which is great. Uh, let me zoom out really quick because I want to report on how long it's been since it's been at 17%. Yeah, it's it's all the way back in November 2018 when we had this just massive spike here um, since we were back at 17%. So obviously it's, it's more a good sign than bad sign uh, when supply is low. But going back to my point about DeFi, it doesn't necessarily mean that these coins are being moved to, you know, Trezor and uh, and external wallets of, of uh, any kind. It could mean that a lot of these coins, and we know this for a fact, a lot of these coins are moving to, you know, DeFi uh, interest bearing types of um, wallets, which are technically not on exchanges, but they're they're a little closer to, you know, a high risk type of of uh, area where they could be sold off quickly as opposed to uh, you know a cold wallet somewhere where people are clearly putting it for safekeeping so keep that in mind for ethereum but overall you know bullish sign once again we like to see that supply and exchanges is essentially at a uh, 
almost three year high now or three year low, I should say. One more we're looking at, uh, or two more, I should say, one more after this. Whale transaction count, which is a measurement of any transaction that exceeds $100,000 USD, regardless of market price. So when you see whale transactions uh, spike like this, it can, it can basically be one of two things. It could mean that whales are accumulating really heavily all of a sudden, or they're selling off really heavily. And usually whatever direction the price is going, uh, the whale transaction spike will kind of reverse it in a lot of cases, particularly when you see big clumps like this. Let me zoom in a tiny bit. We'll do roughly the last year or so, close enough. So for example, when we started to see these big clumps here, back in August of 2020, we just talked about the, the early September sell-off. We had a whole bunch of whale transactions going on on August 31st, really, and even August 30th. Um, and that kind of just stayed up after the drop off happened, which meant that we could actually recover. If it spiked like this, we saw a drop off and then the, the bars immediately went way back down. That would be a sign that, you know, people are planning on, or the whales are planning on keeping it down there a little bit. But if we start to see, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a good example, something like this, uh, we had, we had a big whale spike right here and it was really isolated it caused a kind of a rebound right after this this kind of downswing here uh but it, it didn't sustain itself so the the price just kept on going down um and then you can see from here whale transactions just kind of bottomed out on march 20th or so and then as the the major major bull run happened the the whale transaction numbers grew naturally from there um but these spikes, like beginning on May 3rd, May 4th, seeing this kind of spike and then, or, or set of spikes, I should say, uh, showing up in clumps, that was the scary sign, um, you know, that there was probably something going on and some big profit taking was happening amongst people who could actually make $100,000 transactions with their Ethereum. You see the biggest spike here was after the big decline uh, that likely was some, some whale doing a little bit of, you know, buying back at some point. Uh, obviously I don't have proof of that. I'm not giving investment advice and telling you to find who this whale was, but, uh, it probably is somewhere in our, in our top transactions table, which we can look at together another day or on this week in crypto. Um, but yeah, this was the big spike, but again, it wasn't really long lasting. You didn't see big clumps. So it kind of just sustained and eventually whale transaction count dropped back down. Uh, where we're at now, this means that there's not really much action going on. It, it, it means it's dormant and there aren't uh, at least any signs yet of a huge contingency of whales ready to bump up the price or push it down further. Uh, it can still happen for a variety of other reasons, but at least in the respect of uh, whale transaction count, it won't be, the next big move doesn't look like it's going to be caused by this if it happens tomorrow. Finally, just a quick look at supply distribution. This is actually the percent of coins held uh, by 10,000 to 100,000 coin holders, uh, 100,000 to 1 million coin holders, and 1 million to 10 million coin holders. And highlighting, highlighting the red one here, um, this one is the most encouraging because look at where it was in June of 2020 compared to now. They were holding about 12%-ish, <clears throat> 12.08% back in June, early June. Now we are at 19.5, or 19.25%. That's a massive, massive jump um, in supply held by these, these huge, basically the largest Ethereum addresses out there with a million or more uh, because there is nothing over 10 million. So that's great, but keep in mind that these are often exchange addresses. They're not individual, you know, um, you know, retail holders or, or there could be a couple um, individual holders. It's, it's very impossible to, very much not possible to prove. Um, but the more data we get as time goes on, the more we'll actually be able to identify some of these addresses. But either way, uh, the very, very, very largest addresses in Ethereum 
continue to get more and more of the supply. And the one under it, the gold, is kind of moving in the opposite direction. More recently, you know, beginning on May 7th, they, they did have a big accumulation. And it would probably help if I, I highlight the price. Actually, I don't know if I can on this. We'll just sort of go off of reference. Um, beginning, you know, May 12th, right here, right about here was the all-time high. And that's when we had this huge uptick right afterwards by the 100,000 to million crowd. Now, there probably are a decent amount of um, very, very top tier individual wallets that were accumulating in this gold line here, but it's, it hasn't really sustained itself. It's sort of gone back to this declining pattern, which isn't that good. But on a more encouraging note, a tier that is definitely uh, made up of many individual holders is the 10,000 to 100,000 pink line here. And they have more or less sustained themselves, if not even grown a tiny bit. Uh, we look at we look at January 17th, 2021, we were at 24.559% held by this group. Now we are at 26.25%. So they are holding strong. And this, this pink line of the three lines probably does the most trading of the three. Uh, so they, they could very well have the most impact um, in deciding where prices move next. And right now, they are patiently waiting. They're biding their time and they're not, you know, taking profit down here. If they wanted to, it probably would have made more sense for them to do it right around May 12th or so. And they didn't really move at all. They, they kind of kept right around this, you know, 26 to, yeah, 26 to 26.4% held uh, range, which is, is looking good considering way back in November, they were, you know, three and a half percent lower of the supply held by them. So. Interesting stuff. I wanted to give you guys a little glimpse at, at some of our favorite metrics at Sandman. We'll be talking about it more tomorrow or today, depending on where you are, uh, 7 a.m. Pacific time or 2 p.m. UTC. Uh, try to convert the time zones depending on where you are in the world, but we hope to see you there. We'll be live streaming here, answering many of your questions and uh, giving you a little bit more info on, on you know what the most uh, pressing questions are that you may have about the market. So talk to you guys then and don't forget to like and subscribe.